What role can social media play in the management of disease or the management of health? And how do you handle all that big data? We're at the INSEAD Alumni Healthcare Summit in London, and we're joined by Jamie Haywood, who can answer some of those questions for us. He's the co-founder and the chairman of Patients Like Me, which is a social networking health management site. That's right. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you. Welcome to INSEAD Knowledge. What role does Patients Like Me play in, in patient care, patient treatment, disease management? What role do you play? I think one of the, the sort of um, misunderstandings that's common about our company is that they think we started as a social network and that was sort of the purpose and objective. And that was almost sort of a secondary element. I mean, the, the, the most important thing that we wanted to do was to build a way for patients to share rigorous outcome measures so that they could compare themselves to each other. And once we'd built these tools that allowed patients to measure their condition, understand their history, you know, click through to other people who had wheelchairs or who were on ventilators or who were using, who had different issues with their disease, um, then we sort of built the forum on top of that, which allowed them to interact directly. But the, the primary goal was to sort of share the deep clinical data that allowed us to match that. In fact, the sort of fun history is a little bit that, that the idea came when I was um, online dating and I was building a clinical trial data system and I was also you know looking to find someone to go out with online and as I was plugging in the same kinds of data into my clinical trial system and on the dating site we realized that at the end of the day that what we really needed was a clinical trial plat platform crossed with a dating site and that was what Patients Like Me was born as. But it, it also had a little more serious um, background. I mean it was founded because one of your brothers had ALS. Yeah. So my brother Stephen was diagnosed at 29 uh, with ALS or motor neuron disease. And this is a disease that has the, the neurons in your spinal cord die. And ultimately that means your muscles stop working, you lose the ability to speak, the ability to breathe, the ability to walk. My brother had, had ALS for nine years. Um, the average ALS patient actually only lives three years. When we launched, you know, I, I, I thought that being an ALS expert, and I'd run the very large institute that did research in ALS and knew hundreds of patients, that I was bringing my knowledge to the ALS patients. And it was immediate, as soon as the network launched, that we were learning from the patients. Like, you know, no matter how much I thought I knew, I was learning something every day when I logged on and saw what people were talking about. The place where the world really said, maybe this is something really different, was uh, last year we published a paper in Nature Biotechnology where we refuted a clinical trial that, that had shown that a drug was effective. And we watched the drug be used by the population and we were able to publish and demonstrate that that drug actually had no impact on the patient's outcomes. And that was about a drug related to ALS? Yes, yeah, so it was the use of lithium as a, as, a, as a treatment to extend life and it was done by an Italian group that had shown that it was effective. Um, and we were able to analyze the, the, you know, the data so quickly and so effectively that we showed that it didn't work before anyone had enrolled in any of the follow-up studies. There were four large-scale follow-up studies for you know, tens of millions of dollars to to refute that, and they all failed. And what was the reaction to this paper that refuted that? Was I mean, I'm <laughs> mixed, maybe. No, actually, I you know, I, I, initially people were frustrated because they thought we'd potentially made it a little harder to recruit for the studies, um, and that's a legitimate critique. Um, but most of the physicians were saying, you know, I have all these patients asking to use lithium, and you've given me data that shows that lithium's not doing something, so I have data to discuss with my patient. So you can go on and find something else, hopefully. Put, put your efforts where the, the, that it might actually work. Now, what range of diseases are represented on your site now because it's more than just ALS? So um, about uh, two years ago, we, what, we, what we, we generalized our platform so that rather than having individual disease communities, we built an, a community across all diseases. Um, and in, in that, there are now over almost 2,000 conditions in the system. Now those vary from things like you know, carpal tunnel syndrome or lightweight conditions to obviously very serious things like breast cancer or you know, many of the rare diseases where you can find a child with Neiman Picks type C, things that are extremely difficult to find other patients like you. Um, now what's important to note, and we actually have not done as good a job as we need to, is that there's a difference between a community where we've designed a rigorous set of standards for measurement like ALS or MS or depression versus a community where we don't measure anything. And, and, and so you can, while you can track your treatments and you can connect with some symptoms and other things about a disease like hypertension or gout, which are not diseases that we do, 
We can't do the same kind of rigorous modeling that we can do in an ALS or an MS condition where we can sort of predict outcomes and look at whether drugs work. So, so we really only, we have about 50 conditions that we've done sort of this level one level analysis. And our objective now is to, in, in order, cover the rest of the 2,000 conditions so that we can really measure all of health effectively. Because every disease is different. And, and is that part, that must be part of your plan to grow the company, I mean. We're actually organizing the company around uh, condition verticals or groups or clusters of conditions. And, and, and the person that we're responsible for running one of those things is responsible for upgrading the quality of the data in the system, increasing the partnerships that connect patients into the system, and then maximizing the value of this community in the market in the way people develop drugs or evaluate effectiveness or, or even do care. So it's kind of like a, a, a group disease manager that you would have in each yeah, trying to get you this know, right. One way of thinking about it is it's to registry. I mean, so we have registries for disease all the time, but these registries are silos and they only belong to the one or two doctors or researchers that own them. And they're the only ones that can use the data and they're the only ones that can publish out of it. So we're running an open registry. We're running a registry where anyone can be part of it people can join, that the data is transparent. Let me ask a question about privacy, and I want to give you a little bit of history as to why this is particularly interesting to me. A very long time ago, I remember the debate about whether criminal records should be computerized, and then, goodness, health records, because privacy issues, people could just surf your private records. Right. Now it doesn't seem to be quite as important. Is it because there are greater safeguards? People don't realize that this could happen? Um, what is it? Privacy is shifting in a number of ways. Um, so, so one of which is I think that, that you know, the, 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 the legitimate experience of some of the things that happened in World War II gave people a, 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 an important sense that there was danger in aggregating data. And I think that to some degree that, 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 that group of people who have that instinct, that fear, that directness is actually going away. I think the second thing is just the strengthening of Western democracies to being more part of their, you know, better at serving society have made that these, that the people are more comfortable with having data being used to advance the public good. Um, I think that, that uh, the other thing is, you know, privacy went too far. You know, it, it went from, um, you know, the objective of privacy was to ensure that you were protected and to make sure people were protected to privacy advocates began to sort of prevent people from doing effective research. And then lastly, I, you know, uh, I think the younger generation have a very different concept. Um, I, I struggle, privacy the way I look at it has, um, at some level, if you rename privacy as secrecy, and you ask if you'd like to keep your information secret from anyone who could benefit, I, I think you can change the way you think about these concepts. But I do think that we shouldn't minimize the fact that discrimination is real. And so there are things like, you know, if people know that you have mental health issues, or if people know that you had cancer, those are things that bear on your future employment and other factors. And we have to really ask as a society, as we move into this world of data immersion and understanding big data, can we make sure that we've structured the right protections so that people can't be discriminated against? What, what do you do with all of this data? I mean, do you sell it to other people or give it to others or share it with others? So on our homepage is a little dollar sign there's a little dollar sign that says how we make money. And you can click on that. And, and, the, and the line it says is that um, we take the data that you entrust to us and we sell it in, a, in, a, in an anonymous and uh, an individual manner to the companies that make services or products that are designed to help you. So we essentially tell every patient that we sell their data to the pharmaceutical device medical industry to help understand how to make better medicine occur. And how do you depersonalize it? De-identification is a sort of a legal concept. You take out certain specific information, but, the, but that's actually, you can always rematch data if you do that. So the way we do it is we have contractual obligations where we require that our partners not re-identify data, and that's, that's one of the ways we work with everyone. And, and that's the crux of your business model then? I, I like to think that, that, well, I don't like to think, what, what we do as a business is that we measure whether things work in the real world. And, and our customers are people that care whether things work, right? So um, at the moment, um, that's mostly the pharmaceutical industry because they're the ones that actually have to prove that things work to sell things. But I, I look forward to a day in healthcare where whether things work matter to doctors, to hospitals, to other people that are willing to invest money 
in determining whether they do or not. Who tends to use your site? People with mostly really serious life-changing conditions. There's someone that comes there because when they wake up in the morning, their illness is part of their life and they want to make it better. Almost everyone who uses our system has had a negative experience with healthcare. So they, they all have usually some common story that says they were frustrated or didn't trust or, or felt uncomfortable with an answer they got and they wanted to learn on their own. Let me end by asking you what doctors say about your site and what they see the role of this kind of site or social media in healthcare. From the beginning, um, you know, in abstract, I think that people think, well, patients can't share data accurately or they can't input data accurately and there's just sort of this bias against patient outcomes or, under, or, the, or patient empowerment. So we didn't really talk to doctors until we built it. You know, we sort of just built it and then we let it operate. I, actually, since we've launched, um, any clinician that's treating a patient with one of our major conditions, the ones that we cover well, I actually haven't heard a single objection. And there are still you know, doctors that object theoretically and people that object theoretically, but when you look at the data and you look at what patients are, that what you can learn from a patient, um, when you're presented with the truth of that, I haven't seen anyone that didn't think it was valuable. Okay, Jamie Haywood, thank you very much for being with us on NCAD Knowledge. Thank you.